Well, I want to invite you, if you would, to turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 7. If you can't tell, we're actually going through 1 and 2 Samuel. And so I want to invite you to take a look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting with verse, verse 1 and reading up until verse 14. Uh, as you are turning uh, your Bibles, uh, I invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word for us from this very ancient text. So hear the word of the Lord. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. The king that the writer is talking about here is now King David. And Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. And that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following, following the flock to be a ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all of your enemies before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so, they, so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies." The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you uh, will rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring, offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. This is the word of God for the people of God, and let us say together, thanks be to God. You may be seated. This is a story about David. David is the uh, musician, shepherd boy, turned giant, giant killer, turned warrior poet, turned political mastermind, turned king of all Israel, and he has defeated his enemies, and he has finally consolidated the kingdom. The civil war is over, uh, there's no more war, and, uh, and the northern kingdom of Israel as well as the southern kingdom of Judah are now united. They are one. And Jerusalem, which is the city of David, is now Israel's capital, and it is secure. Everything is safe, victory is David's, and there is finally, for the first time, peace in the land. Now, there's a lot you could say about King David, but this thing is for sure. He is interesting. He is beautifully vulnerable, but at the same time, he is this, we talked about this earlier, he's a violent mercenary. Uh, he, he becomes an adulterer. He is a power-hungry manipulator. And the narratives that we've been reading and will continue to read through tomorrow night of David and God's interaction with him draw in our sympathy as well as our critique. David is one of the most ambitious characters in the scriptures. And David has reached every single goal that he is he, he has set out to reach and he's done it with God's he's done it with God's help. Well one day he he looks around at the palace and he realizes that he he has it all. And David, who is constantly strategizing, is sitting in this amazing house that he has, this house, this home built of cedar, as it is, it's full of great art, it has servants that bring him whatever he wants, and it's got all the amenities of, you know, 1100 BC technology. It's, he, he's got everything that he needs, and it dawns on him that, that you know, he's, he's got a better place to live than his God does. 
Now, if you don't know, for generations, the sacred symbol of God was the Ark of the Covenant. I showed you a picture of the Ark of the Covenant this morning in chapel across the street, and it was carried around wherever, wherever uh, the people went. Now, it's been moved around a lot. It, got, it was carried into the battle. Uh, it was there when victories happened. It was stolen a few times, once by the Philistines, and then later on by the Nazis, whereby Indiana Jones had to recover it. <laughs> I don't know if you know that piece of history. But most of the time, it was protected from the elements under this tent, and that made a lot of sense when the people were desert, you know, they were poor desert wanderers. But now it didn't make any sense to David once they had established national security. So he's always strategizing, always thinking. And he comes up with a great idea. I am going to build a house for God. I'm going to build a temple. Now, you may not know this, but this is actually what kings do when they secured their power they would start temple building programs. Uh, most of the time when a conquest or a succession happens, and military and political leaders alike will build this temple-like structure to de demonstrate to the surrounding people that their God, gave them, their God gave them a victory. And leaders of all countries did this. In fact, leaders still do this now. I don't know if you realize this, but our Capitol building looks very much like a temple. This is a picture of the United States Capitol. Churches do this with their buildings. We have church buildings. This is the Vatican in Rome. We have church buildings that look like temples. These buildings are symbols of success, and they're also symbols of their influence. So David takes this great idea that he's got to build God a, a temple, to build God a house, and he goes to his pastor. He goes to Pastor Nathan, and I just, I just love this part. Pastor Nathan, just, he does what, uh, what I do when people come in, into my office with a great idea for God. He just says, to, and this is exactly what I say, he says, go for it. Now, why wouldn't he? I mean, it's one, of the, it's one of my favorite parts of the job. It's like the best part of being a pastor. I mean, I really love helping people dream about how they can use their gifts and their resources to make a difference for God. I, I spend my life trying to get people to do things for God. Sometimes I just want to look at people and say, do, do anything, do something. Frankly, I'm just really happy when people in our church just every once in a while think about God. So when somebody comes up to me and they say that they want to give to God, I mean, give God something, and it seems big, I'm ready to do, I'm ready to do cartwheels. It wasn't that long ago when this guy called me, I didn't even know him, he called me out of the blue, and he said, and these are literally his, his words, I, I'm not exaggerating, he said, Chris, I live down the street, I got money burning a hole in my pocket. Can I write a check to your church? Um, yes, where can I meet you is the answer. It would be dumb to turn down real estate and free money. That is lesson 101 in seminary when you're a pastor. <laughs> of course, yes, Nathan says. Yes, a thousand times yes. David, go for it. I mean, David is in this great spot. I mean, he is in a really, really good spot. He's got money burning a hole in his pocket. The emergency fund is stocked. Morale is high among the employees. His own house is built. Business is really good. The only question that you've got is, what should we do next? And David comes up with this idea. Let's build God a home. Let's build God a temple. But you know, God always messes stuff up. He always is, is getting in our plans just a little bit. And we read, we read in the text that God isn't so keen on this idea. God doesn't like the idea very much. So that night, God does what God is known to do from time to time. God rearranges and reshuffles the deck on everyone. God reorganizes positions and expectations and in a single statement puts everybody, Nathan and David, in their place. At the beginning of the passage, David, 
you noticed, was referred to as the king. I even had to tell you who we were talking about. But David does, excuse me, but God does not refer to David by that title. God doesn't call him the king. Instead, he tells Pastor Nathan there in the middle of the night, I want you to go tell this to my servant. I, when I read that, I just go, oh, burn. That's a good one, God. <laughs> I mean, that night, it says that the word of God comes to Nathan saying, you go and tell my servant David. And make sure he knows it's coming directly from me. You think that you're going to build a house for me to live in? Thank you for telling me what I need. You know, David, you, you need to know this, don't you? That, that I've never lived in a house. I've never lived in the house from the, from the very beginning. From the time I brought the children of Israel out, out from Egypt to this very day. All that time, I've moved about with, with nothing but a tent. And in all my travels, in all my, in, in all my travels with Israel, I've never said once to any of those leaders that I was in charge of, by the way, why haven't you built me a house made of cedar? Pastor Nathan, there in the middle of the night, gets, he just gets scolded a little bit. And now he is in between a rock and a hard place because he has already spoken for God and he has already given the king his blessing. And now he's about ready to risk his life by turning down the money and taking the blessing away. I've been involved in fundraising from time to time. Some of you have a job of fundraising and you've learned this, that, that sometimes rich people don't like it when you ask for their money. But then there are these other rich people that sort of get offended when they offer you money and then you take it and then you give it back saying, eh, I don't think we want to be in business with you. And this scene makes me feel like I'm, I'm watching an episode of The Sopranos or some other kind of mobster movie and, you know, David is, or Nathan is going to get whacked by David pretty quickly. You know, it's like David's going to say to Nathan, I'm, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. And then all of a sudden we find that God isn't interested. And of course, as all these texts do, it leaves me with all kinds of questions. Why would God reject this offering of worship from David? Doesn't God want us to honor him? Doesn't God want our best? Doesn't God demand our faithfulness and loyalty? Sometimes God keeps us wondering. Sometimes God keeps us scratching our heads. And sometimes God is really okay with leaving us with questions. And the questions, I think, are for us so that we don't quickly assume things about God. But instead, it's an exercise by which we get to pursue the mystery of God. And when we have questions, we're actually seeking God. So we ask questions, and what we do is we examine, and we, when we ask questions, we're looking for clues, and we're peeking around the corners, and we want to listen to God better, and hopefully we will learn something about ourselves and this God as well when we ask questions. So it's okay for us to ask, why? Why did God reject David's offer? And sometimes it's, it's helpful to peer deep into the text like you're studying the Bible like it was a slide under a microscope. But then sometimes it's necessary to take a gigantic step back and to look at the whole biblical picture. And in some cases, when we do that, the ambiguity uh, becomes a little bit more clear and our questions find some answers and we find out something important. Something, so something goes down when we step back and we look at the whole thing that, that, that changes history and only can be kind of seen from a helicopter view. Now, up until this point in Israel's story, the most important theological word, God's word, has been the word if. A couple days ago, I showed you this kind of elementary school version of a biblical timeline. This is what we call salvation history. This is named the biblical timeline, but it, it kind of covers kind of the whole salvation story. And, and the Old Testament is really the, the first part right here up until where you see the picture of the cross. The Old Testament is just a series of many Jewish stories that make up one large uh, Jewish and then eventually Christian story. 
from the beginning of creation through the, the stories of Abraham to the story of the Exodus to the conquest of Canaan and the entry into the promised land through the period when the judges ruled, God had extended covenant promises to this group of people and it went something like this. I will be your God and you will be my people if. Now that's a really important word, if. It, it sounds like if. You obey, I will not forget you. If you will obey uh, and you will do my will, salvation will come to you. If, if you follow me, I will bless you and I will make you a, a blessing. A lot, a lot, a lot of people live with the theological word if as if, as if it is their most important word. They think about it like this, if. I give, God will give to me. If I serve, God will serve me. If I'm good, God will be good to me. If is a deeply theological word. It, it's a word that, it, it's a word that uh, tries to uh, assume an exchange relationship is taking place between us and God. It's kind of a scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Do me a favor and I'll do you one. Make me a promise and then I'll promise you. In some ways, this is how ancient people viewed the relationship they had with divine beings. It's also, it's also how a lot of modern people view a relationship with the divine. And we're kind of seeing that maybe this is how David saw it. The way that David viewed his relationship with God at this point was what you know, the philosopher Martin Buber called this I-it relationship. God was an entity to be used, an object, a means to an end. David's relationship with God was not a relationship with a living free agent being. David's relationship was actually with a box. It was with a symbol but as we have learned over these few days, the text insists that God is indeed free. God is not an object. God is a relational entity. And, and all David has received has come from the hand of God. The ark wasn't a box where God was kept. The ark represented God's freedom. So in this moment of like political brilliance, David now decides to secure his position with God and he's going to do it by giving God's box, God, or God's box, a permanent home, a temple. And in other words, what he's kind of trying to do is he's kind of trying to make a deal with God. And as a result, what David thinks is that he is going to lock God down by making sure that God will never depart him if he builds God a house. David thinks, if I build God a house, God will never leave but my friends, we've talked about this. God cannot be locked down. God is free, able to choose what God wants for God's purposes and God's sake. And, and that's what's happening there that night. It's a conversation between Nathan and God that changes things forever. And, and, and what happens next is not only a plot twist or a theological twist, it's actually a relationship twist. And the world wasn't ever the same after what comes next. The great Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says that, that this just might be, this part of the text right here, just might be the most important section in the Old Testament. Because God puts everyone in his rightful place, sets the order of things, and then does so by revealing his plans. God comes to Nathan in the middle of the night and he says, pass this message on to my servant and tell him to make sure that he knows that it comes from the true king, the God of the angel armies. Make sure that he knows that I plucked him out of the fields when he was just a sweaty runt, uh, scooping sheep excrement for a living. And it was I, the true king, the God of the angel armies, that then took this little one and made him my son. An amazing word God uses here. Make sure that he knows that he is not just my son, but that he is my prince. He's famous because of me. 
And because of the covenant that I've extended to him, now his people have a home. They are no longer wanderers being kicked around wherever they go. I have plans, plans to even give them peace over their enemies. Now, I can just imagine Nathan here, fearful and teeth clenched as he, he goes to relay this message to David, scared, that he is, that, that scared as he has gotten the lecture from God, and he is now waiting to, to hear it. Because the lecture from God came in this way, I'm going to stick to my end of the bargain. But do you know what? God does not say I'm going to stick to the end of the to my end of the bargain, if. For some reason, the God who is the free agent uses another word. Sometimes the translators translate the word furthermore or moreover. But for the first time ever, the most important theological word is no longer if. But instead, it is the word However. And however changes everything. Nathan hears this. The God of the angel armies has one more thing to say. I'm in charge and your plans are not going to get in the way of my plans. David, you're not going to build me a house. However, I am going to build you a house. Think about this for a second. It's like David wants to do something good. But something next level good is in store for David. And the Hebrew word, uh, the, the original Hebrew does this play on words that the English doesn't translate very well. But it's really important to see because it changes everything. House in the Hebrew has, these, has several different meanings. It can mean house, but it can also mean dynasty. In other words, the writer is trying to say, David wanted to build God a house. However, God in his goodness wants to build David a family. In the middle of the night, God showed Nathan that David's building plans for God would get in the way of God's building plans for David. And God's building plan for David all along was to save it was to save David. It was to save Israel. It was to save the world. And God's intent of saving the world is by building a family. This is remarkable stuff. You know, when Jesus of, you know, Jesus of Nazareth is not mentioned in this text at all. But those of the Jesus community seized this text because they believed that it could be understood as what they called the reality of Jesus. In other words, through Jesus of Nazareth, God's anointed, the one who came in the royal line of David, they believed that the whole world might be saved. And they looked at texts like this and they said, it's messianic, that's what scholars said, or it's evangelistic, that's what theologians would add. Some pastors would say, it's the gospel, because for the first time we've moved from if to however, and the Jesus community saw that in Jesus, the new David, God's unconditional love and God's family is now for everyone. That is what God was trying to do through the line of David. He was trying to build us a house. He was trying to build us this family. You know, here we are in this sacred space that we call the house of God, this church, college church. It holds memories for me. I was married in this church I was dedicated in this church. I was baptized in this church. I did the wedding of my brother in this church. I got to participate in the funeral of my father-in-law and got to participate in the funeral of my granddad here in this church. This is a sacred place. God has built a house for us. But we, now the new family of God, must be fully aware that here we are in this place and that there are dangers ahead. And the dangers are this. Friends, God's intent was this, to be a part, for you to be a part of this great family. And what ruins us from being a part of this great family, the danger is when we try to make plans for God and do it our own way. The danger happens when we forget to ask, what does God want for us? The danger lies when we do our projects, 
when we have our ministries, when we build our buildings, when we distract people from seeing what God is doing. And we, this new family called the church that we know is to the church, that we know to be the church now, we never want to be caught in these dangers. So we remind ourselves regularly. We remind ourselves every week in worship. We, we have special times called revival meetings when we gather for worship. And we remind ourselves that in Jesus, God is building us a new family. Only these people don't all look like you. Because they're all made of people like the outcast or the ugly or the left behind. And, and this is a story that began thousands of years ago that we are realizing right now, even today. You know, we realize in a text like this that when God has intention for us and when we set aside the great plans that we want to do to manipulate God or to get in the way of God, God builds us this family. And as a confession that, this fam- uh, that we want to be a part of this, this family, we gather and we tell the truth. And one of the things that we say is we don't have our lives together. And you know what? We can't get them together just being on our own. We must confess that, you know, it's the thing that David didn't do. We must confess that that we are poor and we are hungry and we are thirsty for what we cannot provide ourselves. We need God's grace and we need one another. And so we come in this family and we confess this truth, that while we were still sinners, God died in solidarity with us. He is building us a new family. And now you and I are not alone. We are forgiven. We are set free. We have been adopted into a good family. We belong to God now and we belong to one another. We now have a new identity. We are God's people, people who are rich and satisfied, a people of peace and reconciliation and love. We cry out together because Jesus has been the very best neighbor to us. We will be good neighbors to one another. And then we cry out this truth. We tell this truth. We have discovered as the people of God, as God has built us a family through the line of David in the hope of Christ, that we are better when we are neighbors. We are better when we are family. So guess what we get to do? We get to help one another in real ways. We get to know one another in real ways. We get to be our real selves with one another. And we get to have real conversations with one another. And the reason is, is not because we are all the same. In fact, we are not all the same. But we are all ready for transformation. Friends, I'd like you to do me a favor. Would you... Look at the people next to you. God built this family for you. We call this the church. It's the greatest, it's the greatest gift in the world. It reflects and also embodies the very virtues of his son, Jesus of Nazareth. Virtues like acceptance, and compassion, and deep passion to do the work of God. Virtues like generosity, and encouragement, and hospitality, and accountability, and purity. These are the very virtues of God's Son himself, and this is what God has been doing through his Son, building us a family. I want to invite uh, the worship team to come, if they would. They're going to play some music for a second. And I want you to listen to this. The way of God's grace, the way of God's mercy, the way of God's compassion, the way of God's freedom, the way that God gives us both what we want and what we need is seen in the person who is the glorified Christ, the one who came off the cross in resurrection. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the true king who made up this family, and as the king, he has, he has been sent to establish a royal line of hope. When you looked at your neighbor, you saw the hope of Jesus himself in the faces of those who were sitting next to you. And Jesus was the one who came to set things right. A few days ago, I reminded you that the judges couldn't do it, and Saul couldn't do it, Samuel couldn't do it, David and his sons couldn't do it. And we can't do it. 
But what we can do, Jesus, what we can't do, Jesus of Nazareth is capable to do. He is our king who builds this wonderful house, this dynasty, this family that we call the church. And he does it through his sacrifice. You know as the king, his crown was that of thorns. His throne was a cross of murder. His royal sign, the one that hung above his head, that let us know that he was the king of the Jews. His subjects were the ones who shamed him. And Jesus said about them, Father, forgive them. They have no idea, they have no sense what they are doing. This, I believe, is what David struggled with. This, I believe, is what we are gifted to see in David's life so that we might know that the family that came through David by the hand of God in the person of his son, Jesus, is for us. So I figure that there's a couple ways to respond. You get the opportunity to sing if you want. I am so impressed with this uh, body of students, the body of students next door. I said to Mark Holcomb well, on our first day together, this is a community that sings. So you can sing. What an appropriate response. Maybe you've never been invited into the family, and so, you know what? This is a great time. Grab a friend. You might want to pray at an altar. You may want to grab a teacher, a professor, a parent, whatever the, a youth pastor, a pastor, whatever the case may be, and say, help me know how to get into this family. This sounds pretty good. You're welcome to pray or to talk uh, with people like that. And then the third thing I think that we need to do is this. We need to find a way to uh, express our gratitude. And the way I think we express gratitude is tell people around you how much you love them. Welcome to them to the family. Say, thank you for being my brother or my sister. I'm glad we are adopted into the same family. And we all recognize together that this is not what we have done. This is what God has done in us a long, 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 long time ago, starting a long long time ago, and now making it complete in us even now. So you have those three responses. You're welcome to sing. You're welcome to come pray and join the family. You're welcome to talk to somebody. And you're welcome to say to somebody around you, I'm so glad we're part of the same family. So this would be an appropriate time to respond. God, give us the courage to be able to respond in song, in uh, surrender, and give us the ability to uh, uh, to respond in in gratitude as well. So we do it because you have the best in mind. We're so glad that the most important theological word is not if, and that our relationship with you is not contractual. It is out of your sheer love. No matter what we've done, no matter who we are, it's a however for you. And you have intention for us to be a part of your family. So adopt us and we receive your adoptive love. And we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.